Welcome to The Singing Hole, where we examine how ordinary creatures create extraordinary sounds. Today we'll be deconstructing Jeff Buckley, one of the greatest voices and songwriters of a generation who met a tragically early death. We'll start with a brief history and then deep dive into what makes his sound so extraordinary. If you want to skip ahead to the vocal analysis section, you can click on the bookmark link below. Jeff Buckley was born on November 17, 1966, in Anaheim, California. His parents were both musicians. His mother, Mary, was a classical pianist and cellist, and his father, Tim, was a well-known American folk jazz singer-songwriter. Some people might think that the son was thus trained by the father and followed in his footsteps, but Jeff never knew his father and only met him once when he was eight years old. He was raised in Southern California by his mother and stepfather, Ron Moorhead, and growing up he went by the name Scott Moorhead, not Jeff Buckley. It wasn't until 1975, when his biological father died of a drug overdose, that he decided to go by the name Jeff Buckley. From an early age, Jeff was introduced to a wide variety of music. Classical music was, of course, played at home, and he said they often sang together at home as well. His stepfather introduced him to what he would later cite as his biggest musical influence, Led Zeppelin. The first album that Jeff himself owned was Physical Graffiti by Led Zeppelin. Jeff began playing guitar at age five and decided to become a musician at age 12. He played with a jazz group in high school and studied classical music theory in his teens as well, which may have contributed to the more adventurous harmonies we later find in his music. After high school, Jeff spent about six years working primarily as a guitarist until 1990 when he moved to New York City. Reflecting on his move to New York, Jeff said, I guess I wanted to dash myself on the rocks. I guess I wanted to burn away a film that I felt was settling on me. While in New York, Jeff played at many local gatherings, but one club in particular became well known as his regular jaunt, Chenet. Chenet had a very intimate small setting and was free to attend. Jeff Buckley's sets mostly consisted of cover songs, although there were a few originals he'd written at this point, and he would often challenge himself to play and sing for two hours. He was rapidly consuming and practicing all kinds of music during this era, from Nina Simone to Bucky White to Fishbone, and he also was introduced to some music from India and Pakistan, and we'll later discuss how that may have affected his expression and vocal technique. This constant gigging in New York was a huge growth period for Jeff Buckley, and he later stated that he learned how to perform on stage from playing to small audiences. Although Buckley recorded a demo in late 1990, it wasn't until 1992 that he signed with Columbia Records, about two and a half years after his move to New York. The owner of Janae reflects that before Buckley signed the deal, there would be 10 to 12 limos parked outside of the club, bringing A&R reps to hear Jeff perform. But Jeff took his time, knowing that his career path would be greatly influenced by whomever he signed with. Jeff was driven by artistic creation and vision, and ultimately, he decided to go with Columbia because it was the home of some of his musical heroes, including Bob Dylan. I want to take a moment here to consider Jeff's personality. He wasn't someone who wanted tons of fame or to always be in the spotlight. He was driven by expression and creativity, not stardom. In interviews, he is thoughtful, 
transparent and profound in his responses. Grace is what matters in anything, um, especially life, especially growth, tragedy, pain. Um, love, death, about people, that's what matters. That's a quality I, I admire very greatly. He doesn't mind taking extra time to consider before answering. And in videos, Jeff is frequently doodling, improvising on the guitar or imagining a new musical passage, sometimes while sitting on the floor waiting for the next recording session to start. He was constantly seeking some kind of truth in lyrics and musical creation. Back to his records. The first record released with Columbia was a four-track EP called Live at Chenet. It's important to note that this was not Jeff Buckley's favorite performance. He was very nervous and still rather new to recording. Ultimately, Live at Chenet didn't meet his standards. While only the EP of four tracks was released in 1993, they recorded tons of other songs at that performance. The Legacy Edition was released in 2003, after Jeff's death, with 18 songs on it. By the time Live at Chennai originally released in December of 1993, Jeff was already in the studio recording his first studio album, Grace. It consists of seven original tracks and three covers, and remains the only studio album which he released. Grace was released on August 23rd of 1994. But despite favorable reviews, Grace wasn't a huge commercial success. It was released amongst a time when the grunge scene was thriving in Seattle, and hip-hop and techno were surging in popularity. Pop divas like Whitney Houston and Janet Jackson were huge. Jeff Buckley didn't neatly fit into any of these categories with his jazzy background, progressive rock tendencies, and haunting yet bluesy vocals. Interestingly, Jeff Buckley's music has grown in popularity since his death. In a 1998 poll by Q Magazine, Grace was ranked 75th greatest album of all times. In 2005, Grace ranked 13th in that same poll. To support his releases, Jeff Buckley went out on tour, first in early 1994 to support Live at Chennai, and then immediately afterwards to support Grace. In total, with a few tiny breaks, he was on tour, or in rehearsal for tour, about two years solid. During this time, Grace won much acclaim and notice, especially in the UK, France, and Australia. After such a packed schedule, Jeff Buckley was due to create a second album. However, he was totally zapped. His mother reported that he was exhausted and needed to reevaluate things. We also know from his journals, which Jeff kept in great detail, that he was feeling the pressure. He penned, I don't write my music for Sony. I write it for the people who are screaming down the road, crying to a full blast stereo. Jeff relocated to Memphis, Tennessee to get away and refresh. He'd already recorded some songs for the next album, which was titled My Sweetheart the Drunk, but he wasn't happy with them. He planned to record with a new producer in Memphis. On May 29th of 1997, Jeff was with a friend near the Mississippi River and he waded out into the waters fully clothed. He was last seen floating on his back and singing Zeppelin's Whole Lot of Love. The friend he was with turned around to move a boombox away from a large boat's wake, then back after a few seconds, and he didn't see Jeff anymore. Jeff's body was found dead on June 4th, drowned at the age of 30.
After his death, his mother, Mary, worked to protect and further her son's legacy. She worked with Sony on the release of additional songs, including those Jeff had recorded for his second album. She also has sifted through his diaries and other recordings and done many interviews herself. Jeff's death was a huge tragedy. It's hard to imagine how much more he would have created, especially as his first album has become a legend and many artists aim to live up to it. It rewards extended listening, and I'm still finding new moments of joy throughout. I heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord But you don't really care for music, do you? His cover of Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah in particular has risen to fame since his death. It was re-released in 2004 in the 10-year anniversary of Grace, and then in 2008, it shot to the top of the charts after a performance on American Idol. Gary Lucas, one of Jeff Buckley's co-writers and bandmates, once said, There's a spiritual quality in Hallelujah that touches people. There's a holy quality in that song. But it's like they said about Sinatra, Jeff could have sung the phone book and made it sound great. Well, your faith was strong, but you needed proof. You saw her, babe. The list of people inspired by Jeff Buckley is enormous. Brad Pitt said, I'm constantly surprised that so many people don't know about him still. And at the same time, there's something very, very beautiful about that. Chris Cornell wrote the song Wave Goodbye about Jeff's passing. Bob Dylan named Buckley one of the great songwriters of this decade, and David Bowie considered Grace to be the best album ever made. Jimmy Page, guitarist of Jeff's favorite band Led Zeppelin, said, technically, he was the best singer that had appeared in two decades. But what makes him technically such a great singer? One of the first things you may notice about Jeff Buckley's voice is that he can go high. His upper range is extremely impressive. He regularly would wail out a G5 in grace with a healthy tone too. The highest pitch he's recorded singing is a C6, which he popped out in an improvised jazzy riff while performing at Chenet. Just for reference, that C6 is an octave above a normal high C for tenors, so an octave above all the legendary nine high Cs that are belted out in A Mes Amis, the famous tenor opera aria. Here's that same moment as a spectrogram. This visualizes audio frequencies with those that are higher at the top, those that are lower at the bottom, and there is a left and right channel here. I'll play it so you can see it and hear it at the same time. Notice how cleanly he onsets each of these little moments. You can see that there's not much scooping up, so it's a very clean attack. And on top of that, these are very, very short. This is only about half a second long. Sustained high notes are harder. Jeff sustains an incredibly high A5 during Kangaroo at a performance in Melbourne, Australia in 1996. Just being able to sing high isn't impressive though. Plenty of people can hit a high pitch. Take teenage girls on a roller coaster, for example. But singing a high pitch with good timbre is difficult. Jeff Buckley consistently is able to achieve not just great tone quality, but also a wide variety of expression in this extremely high range 
which demonstrates that he has mastered negotiating some very difficult changes in vocal registration. The uppermost register that Buckley frequently sings in is his falsetto. It has a haunting, hollow, almost wraith-like quality to it. Almost all of Corpus Christi Carol is sung in falsetto. However, Buckley doesn't have to sing these high pitches in falsetto. He has a wide overlapping range between registers, and he's integrated those registers so movement throughout his range can sound very fluid. He can sing in low, full tones, and high full tones, and flat out belt high notes as well, using very thick vocal fold engagement. And he also is able to make his falsetto thinner or thicker, using a technique called reinforced falsetto. Just listen to the incredible integration of vocal registers in this example. Singing in falsetto is quite different in vocal production than singing in lower vocal registers, so some singers have difficulties switching between the two, but not Jeff Buckley. He can make the transition so smooth and seamless, it's hard to know where he switched. Or he can lean into that transition over and over and over to really enhance that breaking feeling and give it extra expression. Here's an example of that. And here's that same moment in a spectrogram. You can visually see when he shifts up to that higher register. It's also really interesting to take a look at the shift in overtones between the lower register and the higher register. The shift in overtones is where you hear that timbre quality changing. The ability to use different vocal registers to create different tone qualities is only the beginning of how Jeff Buckley is expressive. One of the greatest things about his voice is the way he channels emotion into his sound. During one of his great shows in London, he later said, I was just getting some anger out. And the audience could feel that, and they were electrified. Fans online rave about how Jeff Buckley shakes their world. Ellen Vordinelli writes, His voice was utterly untouched and shattered at the same time. Jeff Buckley makes people feel intense feelings. This channeling of feelings is hard to teach, but it's one of the most important things for a singer to do. Just listen to this passage from Lilac Wine. The way his voice is on the edge of breaking makes us feel disoriented and lonely with him. Why is everything so hazy? Isn't that she? Or am I just going crazy? Part of that intensity of feeling comes from his haunting timbre in falsetto. He also frequently bends pitches, either leaning just a little bit sharp or sliding in or out of a pitch, much akin to his role model, Robert Plant. Another tool of expression that Jeff Buckley has mastered is the ability to go from distortion to clean in one held note. Here's that same moment as a spectrogram.
you can really see in this how the distortion has more fuzz around it. And then as the note becomes a little bit cleaner, there's less fuzz and more clear overtones. All of these tools of expression are impressive, but to me, the most impressive expressive mastery is how Jeff Buckley controls and plays with his vibrato. He's able to hold a note completely without vibrato or add vibrato to it. That's not too uncommon to be able to do though, but he also can control the width of the vibrato, which is much harder to successfully do without sounding like a retired 80-year-old opera singer with a wobble. Even more interesting though, is how he incorporates other styles of vibrato into his expression. I mentioned earlier that he was influenced by Indian and Pakistani music. That music utilizes a different kind of vibrato than most Western music, often called a bleating vibrato, which is essentially rapid re-attacking of a pitch. It's extremely uncommon to hear on the radio in the US, but Jeff Buckley weaves it into his music. He also peppers in other elements from ethnic music like trills, ornamentations, and exotic pitch choices. If you listen to the entire intro of Mojo Pin in his Live in Frankfurt performance of 1995, you'll hear all of these. Jeff Buckley was influenced by all kinds of jazz, too. You see this come up in many of his improvisational riffs throughout performances, and you already heard it in the super high C6 moment. The creativity of sound usage, both in the lyrics he's forming and the pitches he's choosing, is totally fascinating. I particularly love, again, the beginning of Mojo Pen. He often would start this song in a different way, finding a new improvisation, here are just a few examples of how he would switch things up. this incredible style and technique would be possible without great breath support. Jeff Buckley had jaw-dropping breath utilization. He could use his breath to channel power into his sound. He could also use it to hold notes long beyond the audience's ability to hold their breath. One example of this transcendent breath is at the end of his cover of Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. It amazes me how by continually pouring his breath out into a note to sustain, he actually takes my breath away. 
If you're not familiar with Jeff Buckley's work and this video has inspired you to listen to his music for the first time, Mojo Pin is a great track to start with. It's the first song on the album, Grace, and was frequently placed as a concert opener. The first few lines also immediately draw you into the extraordinary timbres and expression of Jeff Buckley's voice. I'm lying in my bed, the blanket is warm This body will never be safe from harm Still feel your hair, black ribbons of coal Touch my skin to keep me whole Of course, I hope you'll be hooked and keep going on the album. The next song is Grace, the title song, which I think wholly represents Jeff Buckley's sound more than any other track. If you want to dive deeper into Jeff's life, I highly recommend the documentary Amazing Grace Jeff Buckley, which was released in 2004 and won multiple awards. There's also a book called Jeff Buckley, His Own Voice, which contains his journals and early song drafts. If you'd like to see other artists deconstructed in a similar way, let us know in the comments below this video, and also let us know what your favorite moments are with that artist and why. We'll see you again soon, and until then, keep on making weird noises.